Hi, and welcome to topic 10.2 here in unit, uh, unit 10. Um, so this is talking about redistribution of charge among or between conductors. So yeah, we, we've talked about some of this back in unit eight, um, but again, it's a little bit deeper of a dive. So in unit eight, I think it was more about a conceptual a concept area or an idea, but now it's gonna be, you know, you can potentially see some calculations here. Um, but, you know, just remember, follow those rules that we talk about in this video um, and you should be set up for success in this in this topic. OK, so remember, so I got a little fancy with the animations here. So when conductors are in electrical contact, remember what happens is the charges will redistribute. OK, um, and one thing that we you know that we focus on now is that the potential is going to be the same between them. OK, so here you know, V would equal V, okay? But, so V for sphere one is gonna be equal to V for sphere two, but remember, some of the other stuff is not going to be equal. So for example, sigma, right, the area distribution for uh, object one or sphere one will be greater than for object, uh, sphere two, but what happens is the electric field, okay, um, for one will be, or two will be greater than the electric field for one, right? Because you get more lines coming off of there because of the size, okay? Which then also changes the, the, the charge as well, okay? So some other thing, remember sigma Q over A. So if um, you'll end up with like that inverse relationship between sigma and A, so if sigma is big, A is gonna be is small, Right, it maintains the same Q. Um, just some of those relationships. So they could, they they like those here as well, right? Those relationship style questions. Um, what happens if now we double the radius of one of them, but you know, quadruple the radius of the other one? Um, so they, they like to play around with those type questions here. Uh, so another thing we did talk about in Unit Eight again was grounding. So remember, grounding is an ideal, ideal, idealized reference point that has zero electrical potential, right? Again, in unit eight, we talked about in terms of the field. Now we're gonna combine that conversation about fields with potentials. Um, so um, you're creating a reference point that has zero electrical potential and it can be absorbed in an infinite amount of charge without changing the electric potential. So I know a lot of students, a lot of you guys like to do electric, you know, computer work. I remember when I was in college, we did my friends and I, we built a lot of our computers and we had these static charge, you know, discharging devices, which you see here in this picture. So, right. So if, if there was a static charge built up, there was a way for that charge to build, to, to ground itself. So it wouldn't affect the electrical components on the motherboards and the hard drives and so forth. Um, so that's the purpose behind, if you're into computer uh, architecture, not necessarily program, but architecture, um, that is the reason why you wear that strap. Everybody's like, I'm not gonna wear a strap. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna have enough charge. But also, and then you, you get charge build up and you you basically shock your system and, and you know, create shorts around the, the motherboard and, and the, the hard drives, okay? So there, if you're into computer architecture, make sure you're wearing that strap because that's the purpose of it. Okay, and then finally, um, remember we can induce charge, right? Charge can be induced by bringing positive or, you know, charge, a, a, uh, an electric charge object towards neutral objects, right? Creating separation of charge. Uh, and then in the case of connected uh, charge objects, remember that charge will run along that wire, okay, to the other one, right? To, to create, you know, this balance, okay? And one thing to note is that it, the time that this takes is very short. It's not gonna take like, 20 minutes it's going to take you know milliseconds or nanoseconds for all this to happen because electrons uh, remember those are the charges that move um electrons like move very fast right they move near the speed of light not at, not directly at the speed of light but they can move very fast when we get into talking about um circuits and when we current begins to flow because remember we're still just talking about current that just basically shifts around it doesn't flow freely 
Um, we would look at what's called drift velocity of electrons. You find that the drift velocity of electrons is pretty fast, right? It's near the speed of light. All right, so let's look at an example problem using this. So there's going to be a lot of like algebra, like you can do some different uh, variations of this, you know, this, this solving. Um, so there's that same picture we just had. We have a charge placed on two conducting spheres that are very far apart and connected by a long, thin wire. Um, the, why we, the reason why I say like very far apart is like they don't individually affect each other, okay? Um, the radius of the small sphere is five centimeters and the larger one is 12 centimeters. The electric field at the surface of the larger one is 358 kilovolts per meter. And now what we're going to do is find the surface charge density on both spheres. Okay. Um, really from uh, Gauss's law, you can automatically figure out the charge density on the, on the, on the big sphere because they give you the electric field. Um, but you can also find the Q for that uh, right away. So if we have the electric field, Right, you get KQ over R squared, do some algebra and you get that Q is equal to ER squared over K. And now you do have to convert because this is in kilovolts, we need that in volts. So that's going to be 358 times 10 to the 3 volts per meter, a radius of 12 centimeters, which is 0.12 meters. And we're going to divide that by K, which is 9 times 10 to the 9. Okay, so the amount of charge that sits on that object. I wrote it down somewhere is, maybe I didn't, hopefully I did. Oh, no, is, do, 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 do. Um, I have the numbers, but uh, all right, let me do a quick calculation. So 358 exponent three times 0.12, Minus 0.12 divided by 9, exponent 9, and we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we end up with Q equal to 5.78 times 10 to the negative eighth uh, coulombs. Uh, hold on, let me. Double check that real quick because I have the relationship. For some reason, I didn't write down this answer. So 12 fifths times 2.4. So I know what the answer is. Uh, so 12 fifths, uh, clear. 12 fifths times 2.4 exponent 7 negative. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It's not eight, seven. Okay, I must have lost a decimal point in there somewhere. So I'm gonna erase this. That number should be a seven. Okay, so now we know how much charge is on the big one. All right, that's sphere one. Now what we can do is also use our relationship V1 equals V2 to solve for the amount of charge on the small one. Because remember, this is where we bring in our topic, our unit 10, right? So the, they are equipotential surfaces. So KQ1 over R1 equals KQ2 over R2. Ks will cancel out. And so you get Q1 over R1 equals uh, Q2 over R2. And you find that Q2 is just simply the ratio of R2 to R1 times Q1. And so that ends up being 5 over 12 times the number we just calculated. 5.78 times 10 to the negative seventh coulombs. Now this number I did write down. This is 2.4 times 10 to the negative seventh coulombs. Okay, so this is the charge on the second sphere, right? The small one. This is the charge on the big one. Okay. Now we can figure out the sigmas, right? The surface charge on each one of them. Okay. So we're going to go sigma one equals Q1 over A1. Sigma two equals Q2 over A2. So sigma one equals uh, uh, Q 5.78 times 10 to the negative seventh divided by four pi, or not four pi. Yes, yeah, sorry, because it is a surface area, 1.0.12 squared. Um, this one, did I write this number down? How come I'm not writing these numbers down? <coughs> I 
I have the work on this document, but for some reason I'm not writing numbers down. Which brings me to a good point. Make sure you write numbers down. 5.78 exponent 7 negative divided by parentheses 4 times 3.14 times 0.12 squared close parentheses. Right, and we get a value of 3.2 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs per square meter. Okay, now the next one, right, so we're doing same math, so 2.4 times 10 to the negative 7 divided by 4 pi, but now we're doing 0 0.05 squared, right, because now we're talking about the smaller sphere. Sorry if my calculator is on the top part. This number I did write down. So sigma 2 is 7.6 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs per meter squared. Okay, and you can see, because they both have the same exponent, that sigma 2 is greater than sigma 1, right? Because the second sphere has this smaller radius. Again, apologize for all that confusion with not running numbers down, but there are your answers. So sigma 1 is 3.2 times 10 to the negative 6. Sigma 2 is 7.6 times 10 to the negative 6. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to shift from just talking about conductors in general. Now we're going to move into capacitors and dielectrics.